Welcome to episode 45 of Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. My guest is Dee Jackson Lee. Welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you. Hello. I'm uh, glad to be here today. So where are you hailing from today? Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Hmm. And, you know, out of curiosity, because I'm a fan, um, where did your love of horses come from? I have always loved horses. Since I was a little girl, I had um, little horse statues I collected. I read horse books. I don't know why. Um, I had some friends. My parents were not well off, so we couldn't afford horses. But we had some friends whose father was an auctioneer, and he kept, he would buy and sell horses. So we would always ride whatever he had in the pasture. And um, it was in a small South Georgia town where I grew up. And it was a small town, so they were our way of getting around. We got we climbed on the ponies and rode all over town. And uh, I've just always, um, I don't know, I told a, used to kid with a friend of mine who uh, uh, was my horse vet. She, um, I told her I think we were both horses in previous lives or something. You know, I can imagine that uh, being very possible. There's also... Um... Well, some people have an affinity with animals, and, and sometimes they're, they're more specific, like loving horses or um, dogs or cats or whatever, you know, they feel closest to. And horses are quite majestic. Yeah. They're, I think that horses are um, a very sexy um, subject because they are uh, so beautiful and powerful, and when you climb on their back, you're in complete control of them. And uh, there's something sexy about that. And I didn't intend to, to for um, sort of use the horse theme in all my books, mm-hmm. but when I wrote Bareback, I seemed to um, find a niche that um, nobody else was actively writing. And I had a lot of people who responded um, to say that they um, didn't necessarily read romance novels, mm-hmm. but they would read it because it had horses in it. So, And vice versa. I've had a lot of people say, I don't know anything about horses and don't really care about them, but I love your romance novels. So um, it's just sort of a niche that's worked for me, and, and uh, it's sort of my brand. Mm-hmm. So what what will the first reading uh, you're going to start with, what is uh, the setup for it? I'm going to <clears throat> read from Hold Me Forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a book that I just found out. I'm a finalist for the Lambda Literary Awards. Oh, fantastic. Uh, That's great. For Hold Me Forever, it's very Southern. Uh, it's the third book in what I call my Southern Secret series. There, there are no overlapping characters, but um, each one has a common theme of being set in the South, and there's a secret. The um, The short scene that I'm going to read, um, May St. John's uh, only relative that she's aware of uh, has died, her grandmother, um, who the family all called Big May. And um, so May is, has gone to the attorney's office for the reading of Big May's will. And this is the scene that starts May on her journey that takes her to Louisiana where she, she meets... Um, ultimately her love interest. Mm -hmm. So, just uh, get started here? Yeah, just start. Okay. I could hardly believe she's gone. John Hatley's hands were sweaty as he clasped May's. The old grandmother might have been a small woman, but by God, she filled up a room when she walked in. May followed him into his richly appointed office, and sat in an elegant wing-back chair as he moved behind his mahogany desk. She listened politely as he continued to ramble, even though she wanted to scream at him just to read the damn will. The past week had been filled with so much nervous expectation that she had nearly resorted to taking one of Big May's nerve pills. If the will had been written and signed years ago, why in the world did it take a week before he could read it to her? Big May had told her nothing about their finances, and she needed to schedule the paying of bills and other things. She hated to be disorganized. Hatley finally left off his reminiscing and began to shuffle the papers on his desk. May shifted forward in her seat. Had Big May left a personal letter for her, like in the movies? 
She longed to hear her grandmother's final advice. She had given it freely and constantly throughout May's life, whether she sought it or not. So why would she be silent now? Hadley cleared his throat. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much your grandmother has shared about her finances with you. May frowned. Unfortunately, she considered it unseemly for women to discuss money. Then what I'm about to tell you may come as a bit of a shock. Nothing my grandmother could nothing about my grandmother could shock me. May didn't care about the money, she really didn't. What words of wisdom, what message had Big May left? Your grandfather left Big May financially comfortable, but the stock market plunge a few years back drained her funds. May hesitated to let his words sink in. How badly drained? Okay, maybe she did care about money. I'm afraid I'll have to recommend that you let her house go into foreclosure. It's already mortgaged for more than it's worth, and she quit paying the mortgage life policy on it when the, when the market went bad. May didn't want to give up the house. She'd grown up there. It'd been in the family for generations. Surely she had other assets I could sell. How did she pay her dues at the country club or have cash for clothes and groceries? She never once mentioned a need to conserve. You've been living off the loan she took out against the house and its contents. She's actually a year behind in her dues at the club. But as chairman, I convinced the board that to kick out a member with such high social standing would be indecorous. But she never said a word. She paid my college tuition and sorority dues every year without complaint. Surely Big May would have given some indication they needed to be prudent with their spending. I believe she hoped you would marry well and your future husband would remedy the family money problem. How archaic was that? May straightened in her chair and glared at the man. Mr. Hatley, my grandmother would never barter me in marriage like a cow. He raised his hand to ward off her anger. Precisely why she refused to do more than gently press you in that direction. And most likely, why she never advised you of the money situation. She wouldn't force you. His concession did little to damper May's indignation. If we needed money that badly, why didn't she remarry? At least a dozen men would have jumped at the chance. I asked her the same thing. She said she'd done her duty to the male population. She might die poor, but she'd die on her own terms. May stared at him for a long moment. So, there's nothing? He shook his head. I didn't say that. He pushed the contract across the table for her to read. She left a very small trust fund that's protected from her, her creditors. It will pay you 15000 a year as long as you produce annual veterinarian statements that her poodle is in the best possible health for his age and all his vaccinations are up to date. He laid the check before her. The first 15000 is yours when you sign the contract. Agree into the terms. Rhett? Big May provided for Rhett and not her? She grabbed the offered pen and scribbled her name where he indicated. Big May's didn't raise her to be a fool. Apparently, I don't have a lot of options. She folded the check and slipped it into her purse. Hatley took the signed contract. I have to warn you that should he die, the rest of the trust will go immediately to the local SPCA. So I'll be careful about letting him off leash. The large office had grown claustrophobic, pressing in on her. This was a nightmare. May closed her eyes and put her hand to her forehead. Maybe she had a fever and was delirious. And when the fever broke, she would realize this was all a bad dream. There's more, Hatley said. Of course there is, she muttered. Well, that was a very unpleasant surprise. Uh, yes, and there's lots more surprises uh, down the road for May. Um, but uh, I model a character after a woman that I actually know. So it made me chuckle when uh, I got a review on Amazon from uh, somebody from the UK who 
said, do people really talk like this? This is not realistic. <laughs> but it's, it's real. <laughs> well, it's like you could answer, well, some people think you talk funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, but um, I had a lot of fun with that book because the main character was a lot of fun. And as always, um, in my books, there's, there's sort of an underlying theme that um, – People are what they might seem to be, mm-hmm. and um, and May is one of those people who seems like a helpless sorority airhead, mm-hmm. but it, it turns out that she's actually extremely capable and um, and very resilient. I'm still trying to figure out how I would feel if I if somebody read a will to me and let me know that an animal was. Uh, being cared after <laughs> a trust no. for a pup and not nothing for her but debt well she um she loves Rhett and she would have cared for him anyway mm-hmm. um and she does say later she she tells him well it seems that i have to depend on a man to take care of me after all <laughs> <laughs> that's very clever so but- so the next reading that you're doing, is it um, modern times, historical? Um, what genre is it in? Um, <clears throat> both of these books are um, that uh, I had come out this past year are um, they're rom- they're in the romance genre, mm-hmm. um, lesbian romances. The... Um, the, I'm working right now, currently um, finishing up my first uh, attempt at a fantasy novel. Oh. But, um, but both of these are, um, are pure romances. Mm-hmm. One of them, I, I had two books come out this past year, mm-hmm. and um, Homie Forever was very sweet and um, Southern. And Every Second Counts is the third in my Cherokee Falls um, series. And uh, the it's pro- it is definitely the most erotic of the books that I've written. And I was a little bit afraid that it would turn off some of my um, romance writers, uh, readers, who um, were used to me writing traditional romances. I never do fade to black sex, but... There's always just an appropriate number of um, sex scenes. Well, Every Second Counts is about Mark Ryder, who is a rodeo um, rider. She rides bulls and broncs, Mm -hmm. and um, she's injured and goes home to recover and meets Bridget Leroy, who was a character um, who didn't get the girl in one of my earlier books, Longshot. And I wrote this book um, because the... um, I got emails after Longshot came out from several people that that said um, they wish Bridget had gotten the girl <laughs> mm-hmm. in the end, and that Bridget needed a girlfriend. And so I kind of stuck that in the back of my head. And several years later, I wanted to write um, writer who was a character that I had um, written in an internet group where we did role plays and wrote stories together, mm-hmm. and. Um, it was a character that I role played for that group, and I really liked the character. She's kind of, kind of um, cocky and um, and sexy and very athletic, and um, she. But a lot of her bravado covers up a really insecure person inside, and um, so that's the person. One of the emails I got said, "Bridget needs some big." Um, some really sexy butch to come rock her world. And I instantly <laughs> thought of Ryder. And um, that's how every second counts. And it turns out it's so far it's been my best seller. Uh, I was afraid that it wouldn't sell because it had too much sex in it, but I was completely wrong. <laughs> Did you do you feel that um, you expanded uh, your fan base, that different people were being attracted to this novel? Or folks that uh, you're quite familiar with uh, as fans have signed on for this book? I think I probably did um, increase my fan base a bit because the reviews um, 
I'm not, sh- you know, I'm not sure. It's, it's either that I'd finally written uh, Every Second Counts as my fourth book, and it could just be that I've finally written enough books that I have a pretty solid fan base and, and it's spreading. Mm-hmm. Um, or it could be that this was just kind of a hot, the reviews on it said, wow, this is a really sexy book, and people started buying it like crazy. So tell me a little bit about this next reading that you're going to do. Um, This is from Every Second Counts. Um, Bridget is an artist, and she has, um, she first approached Mark when she saw her in an art gallery, because Mark has a very athletic, androgynous kind of body, and Bridget's teaching um, one of those um, classes where the um, students learn to draw models who are nude Mm -hmm. and um they um and so she had told um she had told mark she decided she didn't want to see mark they've already had one encounter she had told her she didn't want her to come and model for her class even though she had initially asked her to but mark shows up anyway bridget's late to the class because she's she's gotten delayed and she walks in and her assistant Already has everything set up. The students are drawing, and um, that's when uh, this scene starts where um, Bridget walks into her classroom. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the model is nude except for a Greek-style helmet that covered the face turned in profile. Muscled back turned to the students and feet placed shoulder-width apart. The model's left hand gripped a long spear planted parallel to the body, accentuating the well-developed bicep. The right hand rested on the model's hip, bulging the muscle at the top of the shoulder. Bridget frowned and narrowed her eyes. Great model, huh? Karen said. I don't know where you found her, but that's an amazing body. Her? I thought I told you to call Jason because Miss Ryder wouldn't be here. He couldn't do it, and Miss Ryder called to confirm that she'd be here after all. Lucky for us, huh? It'll be fun to see who picks up on her gender before we switch to a frontal view next week. She didn't want to envision Ryder naked, standing in front, facing her whole class. Sure, her students had drawn nude models before, but not a body that she knew so personally. Not this body that she'd slept with, drooled over, touched, tasted, fucked. It was so clear now. How could she not have recognized that back, that ass, the moment she walked in? Her breath caught. They were faint and nearly healed, but those were definitely scratches across Ryder's left butt cheek. The vivid memory nearly stole her breath. Her nails digging into Ryder's ass, urging her to thrust harder, faster, as she was about to come. Bridget sat on the desktop and squeezed her legs together to stop the throbbing in her crotch. Heat rose up her neck, and she glanced around to see if anyone noticed. But they were all sketching. She took a deep, few deep breaths and refocused on her job. She moved from student to student, offering suggestions. When the buzzer sounded, she pulled a curtain to conceal the stage and held up a robe as Ryder pulled off the helmet. Ryder drew the robe around her shoulders, but left it hanging open as she followed her into the small office that served as a dressing room. Bridget closed the door and whipped around to glare at her. What are you doing here? I came to do what I said I'd do. Ryder's hair was soaked from wearing the metal helmet under the hot lights. Sweat trickled down her neck, between her breasts, and over the bands of her abdomen. Pose your robe, please. I'm hot. Ryder said, exposing a breast as she lifted the terry cloth collar to wipe her face. Besides, it's nothing you haven't seen before. Ryder took a step closer and Bridget breathed in her spicy scent. Something I'd be happy to show you again if you want. God, she did want. Badly. This room was too small. Ryder was too close. She needed to get out of here. But when Ryder took another step forward... The door at her back kept Bridget from moving away. The robe had fallen back on her shoulders, bearing her breast. Her top nipples were so close, Bridget could almost feel them touching her own. Ryder's eyes were liquid chocolate, her gaze melting. Don't, 
She whispered as Ryder's lips brushed hers. I can't help myself, Ryder murmured. The kiss was slow and languid. Ryder's tongue was hot, but her mouth gentle. She clutched Ryder's robe to push her away, but instead pulled her closer. Push, pressed between the door and her back, and Ryder's hard body, she whimpered, slipped her hand lower, downward, to clutch Ryder's firm ass. Carefully, no fingernails, no marks. So that's Ryder and Bridget. <laughs> and for those of you who just fainted... <laughs> They're much, uh, they're much spicier um, sections in the book, too. So I, I, I now see why you got the reviews that, uh, that you have for this book. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was sort of a surprise to me um, that, it, that it's selling so well. Because, um, like I said, I had some reservations about it. But um, because it is... Um, I talked to my publisher, um, Bold Strokes Books, I talked to uh, Lynn Barreau when I saw her in P-Town about, um, I've written, um, I've had a good handful of short stories that tend to be more erotic than my novels, uh, published in different anthologies, and um, short stories are one of those things that you just get paid a fee for and you re and you retain um, copyright over them. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I suggested that uh, to do an anthology of my short stories and write another handful of new ones to go in it. Mm -hmm. And um, and she thought that was a good idea. So in 2015, I've already turned in the manuscript. Um, I, Writing Passion will be um, the name of the anthology. Mm -hmm. And it's anchored by a 15,000 word novella that was sort of a short story that just wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that novella is the, the centerpiece of it is, is called writing passion and it's definitely writing passion. Uh, the anthology is definitely, um, my mo most erotic work, still romantic, but I call it erotic romance. So, so your muse is misbehaving lately. Yes. <laughs> Your muse is like, I am feeling so darn naughty. You're going to have to write different stuff. Yes, it's a, um, but it was fun. I had a really fun time. I like writing short stories, but I also like writing the uh, novels too. Um, I don't have a book coming out in 2014 because um, I asked for some extra time to write the first in what's going to be a series of the Dragon Horse War, um, which is the fantasy mm -hmm. that I'm finishing up now. It will come out in February of 2015. So I'm trying to see if I'm remembering properly. If not, you know, just shoot me. But did you have a short story in A More and More? Yes, I did. Um... That, I believe that one was the portrait. I'm trying to think, <laughs> I, I had I read it a little while ago, and I was like, I I think I remember seeing, I think I remember seeing her name somewhere. What was this short story about? Remind me, and then I can talk about it like I'm brilliant. Um, the short story was um, was about a woman who is uh, the the anthology was um, the theme of the anthology is about couples who've been together. For for a long time, mm -hmm. not couple, not um, people just meeting. And um, so I wrote a short story about a couple who'd been together for 20-something years. And the older one in the couple is about 10 years older than her partner. And she's about to have a birthday, and so she's stressing over the fact that she's getting older. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the fact that they've had a sexy um, neighbor move next door that seems to be hanging out at her house too much <laughs> uh, around her um, partner. And, um, and so it's a, it's a little story about um, the... Um, Was it a continuation of another uh, story with the same characters? No, those were two fresh characters. Um, and I don't think, I don't feel a novel in those. Mm -hmm. um, 
you might be thinking, I had a story in, um, I've had, there's been several Bold Strokes anthologies where I did stories from characters who've been in my books. Um, and, uh, I did a story called The Pond. Yes, which, that's what I'm thinking of. Okay. That's what I'm thinking of. The older couple from Long Shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, I was like, I was like, that doesn't sound familiar. I said, this one, t I love that story. The, the Pond is also going to appear in um, Best Lesbian Romance mm -hmm. 2014 or 15, whichever. I don't know, the one that they're putting together now, it must be 15. Um, the, I really um, liked it. You know, there was some heart, obviously some heartbreak in there. But I loved yeah, the yeah. continuity. And it's very challenging to, you know, capture so much in such a little space. There's this book that I read uh, by Lynn Ames, and I think it's called Eyes on the Stars. And um, it broke my heart because these, the, these two women spent the majority of their life not together and longing for each other. And then just as their life, um, they're, they're going to pass, they find each other and connect. And I remember how, you know, I wanted to throw myself off a bridge, whereas, you know, I found your short story so charming. Um, that, was, that was the older couple from Long Shot, which mm -hmm. was my second book. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't intend when I started writing Long Shot to um, put them in there, but they just sort of surfaced when I started writing. And um, one of the women, it was an older couple that, like you said, had spent most of their life apart because of the times they grew up in and um, societal pressures. And um, they, um, one of them was, uh, by the time they reconnected, one of them uh, suffered from rheumatoid arthritis and the other one had dementia, so she was in and out. But, the, but with her dementia... Um, and I wrote that because my mom had dementia in her last years. And mm -hmm. it was weird because she couldn't connect with things that had happened yesterday, but she would remember things from way back. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to Lori. She could remember Willie, who she called, whose name was really Millie, but she thought Millie didn't fit her, so she called her Willie. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, she uh, could remember Willie, and she met Willie's... Um, great niece who looked very much like her and she kept thinking that um, Tori Grayson was her old love Willie oh. and I you know and I had a big response in that book I had a lot of response from that because um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of us um, baby boomers now have elderly parents that a lot of them suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia and other um, related um, memory diseases. And um, I was surprised that I got a lot of emails about that. People really liked seeing that in the story. Yeah, there's this, um, there's another, uh, like a series of short stories by Fran Hecrote, and it's called oh. Odyssey of the Butterfly. And it had, you know, some really stressful times between a couple that had been together. Um, and one of them had dementia. And, you know, there, th she ended it on an upbeat, like as it, you know, the magical qual qualities of, of this butterfly changed things for the better. And at the end, uh, she, Fran had said, you know, I did that for the comfort of the reader because when somebody is suffering from dementia, there's no coming back. There are good days and there are bad days, but there's no going back to the person that they were before it happened. Right. Yeah. So I sort of learned from that second book that um, things that um, are real life uh, that I experience, there's a lot of other people out there experiencing the same things, and um, they really add to the basic romance story that you're writing. Um, people identify with them. The other and, thing that I, I heard, sorry to interrupt, was there. there's a longing... Um, for romantic interests that are, you know, older than 40 or 50 or 60, you know, something other than, it seems like a lot of the um, current romances is that it, they tend to have their characters somewhere in their early 30s or about, 
And, you know, there's a, a, a large call for, you know, the lives of older women. And what many spring chicones don't know is that, you know, your sex life doesn't necessarily die, you know, when you're older. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely does not. <laughs> I, you know, I think it just depends on the person. Some people uh, who are um, very sexual um, never lose that. Mm -hmm. And and some of the people that seem to when they get older never really were that sexual when they were younger. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just my uh, unprofessional opinion. I grew up, my mom and dad um, were um, not inappropriately, but they were always um, physically affectionate in front of us. Mm -hmm. And um, they always had a very healthy attitude towards sex between a committed couple. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Uh, so I grew up with a healthy attitude towards it. Yeah, my, yeah. my parents are um, baby boomers, and they've been together since my mom was 13 and my dad was 14. Yeah. And um, and they still have a sweetness about them. And a few years ago, when it was their 40th wedding anniversary, I had put together um, a slideshow from when they were babies to when we, they started dating and onwards. And the cover, I used one of their wedding photographs, and she looked at the picture. She's like, oh, I just want to kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> well, my you should. You should. And um, the, the, um, the short story that you, um, you asked me about before, which wasn't the right one, the portrait that is in uh, a more and more, um, it, it's, a, it, it's about couple that who really loves each other you always see each other you don't see the aging you still see the person that you fell in love with and and that's the theme of that short story was that with um with the character who said that she had stopped looking at her partner and then was seeing her again through new eyes um see <laughs> my memory is yeah, shot yeah. My memory shot, really like I have. Me. You read a lot of stuff, and it's hard to. Keep it. <laughs> you know, you know, listeners, forgive me. I just I read so many things that I have tons of different storylines running in my brain, and usually um, when I'm doing a traditional Liz McMullen show episode, I have notes next to me with character names and you know maybe you know important instances in them so that I can keep things straight because. I, um, no pun intended, um, I read in a year, I'd say at least a hundred books or more. And, uh, so things start to run, run together. But like I, I said before, and forgive me for getting, I got one story right and one story wrong. Um, but <laughs> That's I, okay. I understand because I, I read, I'm a voracious reader myself, which I think helps improve my writing with every book that I write, but, um, I, I work evenings. I'm a newspaper editor mm -hmm. at my real job. <laughs> and, uh, so I work an evening shift. So I don't watch primetime TV. Mm -hmm. um, I don't record things and I don't miss it mm -hmm. because I don't know what I'm missing, I guess. Uh, instead in the mornings I, um, I read or write, and uh, then go to work. So I probably read at least a book a week, if not more. Like um, I read two books last week, and um, I've got two that I need to finish um, before the upcoming weekend at the Lone Star Lesbic Festival in Austin. Mm -hmm. I'm moderating a panel, and two of the um, authors on that panel, I haven't read their books yet, so I downloaded their I downloaded a book from each of them, their most recent books, and. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading those before this coming weekend. Yeah, I find what if like I'm interviewing somebody whose stuff I've read before, I I try my best in the days beforehand to at least scan or look at it a little bit closely so that I can remember such things because 
you know, for the authors that I really enjoy, I want to get in depth in conversation. And um, but the converse side of that is sometimes I have a much better memory for their work than than they did because, you know, it's several years ago, and, and some authors are like, "That's too long ago for me to hold everything in my head," as compared to <laughs> other things that I have written. And um, I'm having on. Uh, Catherine Friend, who I madly love, The Spanish Pearl, and I've read it so many times, like, I practically have it memorized, and she's like, I'm gonna have to read this before we do the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I've read all of her books, too. Oh, uh, it's just I fantastic. love them all. I love The Spanish Pearl and The Crown of Valencia. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, said, I think there's cool. a Pirate's Heart is the other one. that she Pirate's Heart, and mm -hmm. that's awesome in audio, too. I also listen to audio books. So you see why I don't have time to watch TV. Well, you know, I, I you know, I don't watch a whole lot of TV, TV either. Like I get a lot of my entertainment like you do from reading. You know, there are little things that I like, you know, I like to watch Rehab Addict, which is about uh like it, there's a a very awesome female uh, contractor. Well, she's not a contractor, but she flips houses and so like I like to watch her fix things. Yeah. Um I find her fascinating because she's got an obsession. What The reason why it's called Rehab Addict is she likes to take old houses, many that have, um, Nicole Curtis is her name, many that have been condemned, and she brings them back to life, and, you know, you know they're all historical homes, and so that's her passion. And I was like, I like watching that. I like watching that. I like watching history. I like watching people making stuff and doing things. But I really don't watch um, popular television anymore like I used to. Yeah, yeah, I like those. Um, the I like HGTV too. When I go to my sister's, I finally cut off my cable here because I never watched it, mm -hmm. and it seems silly to pay a hundred bucks a month for cable. Mm -hmm. But when I go to um, visit my uh, family in Georgia, I usually stay with my sister, and um, and I can I could sit there forever and watch HGTV mm -hmm. and. I just, I love watching those where they flip houses and... Um. I think it's so rad, you know, and I love when they have... The reason why I like Nicole Curtis rather than some of the other uh, women who do the shows is they tend to choose very feminine women who have long hair. And even though Nicole Curtis does, you know, she always has her guns out and she she has a lot of queer people on her... Um, her team that fixes things. And so uh -huh. I kind of, I dig that about her. And, you yeah. know, it's like, oh, you can know how to fix things, but you have to be pretty. <laughs> like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, if you're a woman and then if you're a guy, like, whatever. Um, well, it's television, you know. Yeah, they have to be hunky like the Property Brothers or whatever who are twins. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But I like that stuff. And, I, you know, what's strange is that... Um, from the time I was in high school, I always liked watching uh, either true crime or fictionalized crime shows. And then I realized I don't, I don't want to watch shows anymore that are about people passing in violent ways. I, that's why I switched to watching these like home improvement shows and the History Channel, but like some of the cooler, interesting things rather than. And then he killed his wife because she was cheating on him, and I was like, I don't want to see this plot again. I need something right. different. Well, see, um, in my real job, um, I edit a lot of crime mm -hmm. because I edit mostly breaking news. And um, so I don't write uh, crime novels. Mm -hmm. Two of my um, best buddies are Carson Tate and uh, V.K. Powell. And they both write. Um, Vic is a retired um, deputy police chief uh, from a one of the larger towns here in North Carolina and Carson, a defense attorney. And, uh, they both write really good crime novels and I read their novels, but, um, Carson, uh, was saying one day she was feeling around for an idea for her next book. And mm -hmm. I gave her a suggestion, um, which was only a suggestion. And, and she certainly made something a whole lot more out of it than what I'd suggested. But she, um, I told her Beyond Innocence was that book. Oh. Uh, she said, are you sure you don't want to use this idea? And I said, no, I, I, I edit crime at night. I don't want anything to do with it when I go home. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually reviewed that book. I liked it a lot. It was an interesting plot. And 
But I, I can see what you're talking about. Like there are a lot of different types of genres of books that I enjoy to read, but that I wouldn't, I don't think that I have the ability to write. Like I, I, I find fan, depending on what kind of sci-fi fantasy you write, like I can't imagine creating an entire world, you know, out, out of whole cloth. And I, I admire people who can like Jane Fletcher and, um, yes, yes. It's been, a um, it, it's, it's been a real um, experience for me trying to um, put together. In fact, I, I went and visited Jane Fletcher mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, her and her partner, Joni, um, year before last. And I, when I was first thinking about writing the Dragon Horse Award, mm -hmm. and um, I talked with Jane extensively about it. She gave me some really good tips. Um, she's way more brilliant than I'll ever be. But um, I've, I've given it a pretty good shot, I think. And, you know, you never know as a writer. Sometimes you'll write something and you'll go, damn, that's pretty good. And then the next time you look at it, you'll go, what was I thinking? This is sucks. <laughs> We're always so hard on ourselves. Like, I, from one, I, I haven't interviewed Jane. Um, but when I heard of her, she is the uber planner. Um, she has things outlined and very organized and... Um, she did something that tweaked me out, which is, you know, write things out of sequence, which I, I was like, no. So I had, yes, I did. you know, she's just, she's just amazing. Um, she's also, uh, somewhat of a history buff and, mm -hmm. um, the week that I spent with her and Joni and, uh, in England, she, they live in Southwest England, which is like living in a storybook. Aww. You expect Miss Marple to walk around the corner at any moment. The, um, they, uh, she knows everything about the history there. And I had a wonderful, wonderful week with them. Um, Jane taking me around and showing me uh, all of the, we went to a castle. We went to the Roman baths. Mm -hmm. um, and it was amazing. She's, she's an amazing lady brilliant person and I wish she would um I wish she would put out another book real soon <laughs> you know one of the the beauties of um go, knowing different authors is enjoying storytelling not just um as what people get on the page but like sitting around and having coffee or dinner um, and just going with whatever stories are in your mind or what you find valuable and my father was a big history buff and um, he always had also, you know, culture was very important to him. So he always took us to the opera and the symphony and the ballet and traveled and whatnot. And as a result, I have this huge love for listening to storytellers or, you know, people who have a different view on the world, which is why actually I created the series, uh, Lizzie's Bedtime Stories, is because I like for people to read me stories and never outgrew that. Have you uh, interviewed Ali Valley yet? I I have I have had her on the show. Um, she is an amazing storyteller. Oh my goodness! I saw her on a panel, and I I'd love to have her on the show. Um, when I had had her booked, but her wife was um, unwell, and so yes. I haven't rebooked her again. But I think what I'm going to try and do is, if she goes to GCLS, I will lasso her and have a conversation because I'm going to be recording um, impromptu episodes. Um, that are not review episodes, but just like almost the same concept as I was just talking about, getting a lot of interesting storytellers together and seeing what happens. Um, so you'll be at GCLS? Yeah, I'm going to have a table uh, for the Liz McMullen show, and I'm also going to be promoting my debut novel. Awesome. Yes. I'll be there. Yay! I'm so excited. There, I have um, Every Second Counts. The uh, sexy one that I read from is a finalist in the... Um, Traditional Romance? The, the, no, they haven't announced those finalists yet. Oh. No, in the um, the one with Everybody Votes on. Ann Bannon? Ann Bannon, yeah. It's a finalist in the Ann Bannon um, category. That's so great. I, you know, one of the things, um, I like the collegiality of going to G GCLS and, um, I'm actually on the education committee, uh, for GCLS and it includes the academy, which we're, we're in the midst of putting together amongst other things. Um, 
Um, also, I manage the mentoring program. So it'll be cool to see some of the people that I only know uh, via email. And um, the other thing is I went to a women's college, Mount Holyoke College, and I loved the camaraderie of, of being around brilliant, motivated women. And I have to say I went to GCLS this year, and, and that's one of the things that I like best of it. it. It had that same feel to it. It's an awesome organization. Um, and uh, I'll give a little plug here for their silent auction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm donating a, a T-shirt that um, promotes um, my Dragon Horse War book mm -hmm. um, and um, a tote bag of, that will contain the T-shirt. Um, the readers, the whoever wins it, their choice of my books that have been published, a signed copy, mm -hmm. plus um, a lifetime of free D. Jackson Lee books, whatever I write in the future, you get a free uh, autographed copy. Wow, that is really special, listeners. I hope that you're paying attention. I wanted to, I wanted to donate something that would, because I think that GCLS is a really awesome organization, and I wanted to donate something that would, um, would make a little money for them. Yeah, that's... Help. That's truly special, and you know, also it's a great gift to whomever wins. You know, a fan of yours will, you know, have access to all the delicious things that you have in the works in the future. Um, so hopefully, that'll be a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, for you know, we all agree. You know, like we we like to hustle up our favorite authors, write more. <laughs> we need more stuff. We need it faster. Um, this has been a really fun uh, little interview. I liked your readings, and I enjoyed your company. Uh, hopefully, yeah. I'll have you on for another interview. Um, I'm sure. I'll see you at GCLS. That could be fun. I'm sure that, like, I'll probably get together, like, a little BSB hootenanny. <laughs> All right. That sounds, that sounds good. Maybe I'll, uh, I can read something from Writing Passion. Ooh. Yeah. Sounds good to me. So thank you so much right. for coming on. Thanks, Liz. I appreciate it.